All right, I wanted to welcome everyone. Uh, we're doing a webinar tonight. Uh, Stags Lacrosse is sponsoring this. My name is Dan Fertel. I'm uh, one of the uh, kind of help organizers for Stags, and we're we're proud to have uh, five presenters tonight. They're going to talk a little bit more about college lacrosse, uh, some of the myths, some of the realities, especially in regard to recruiting. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to them, but I just wanted to let you know a couple things. Um, we will have a survey as you exit this webinar. If you could fill it out for us, let us know how we did tonight. Tonight, um, There also will be a couple polls we're going to take during the webinar that will show up. So if you want to uh, answer those polls, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly make sure that we track that information also. The other thing we're going to do uh, is we're going to have uh, the ability for you to ask questions. There's a questions tab on your, on your um, uh, control panel there. If you want to type in a question, I will either forward it on to the guys or we will certainly take questions as we wrap up the, the general presentation. I'll try to make questions available for people and turn their mics on as we're going to actually have um, questions that we think are worthwhile asking. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over and I'm going to have each of the guys um, just do a little bit of a kind of bio about themselves and uh, then we'll start the program. So uh, Joel, do you want to go first and, and give a little bio and we'll we'll start the program hi guys i'm an assistant coach at denison university my name is joel zaleski and this is my fourth year at denison and uh, i like some of you as i mentioned to these guys before i'm from a non-hotbed area as well it's nice to meet everybody oh, hey everybody my name is jeremy napier i'm the head coach at edgewood college the new division three program there in madison uh, I, I moderated, well, I'm going to moderate this, and I was able to uh, grab the panel here, uh, just having Cap and Kevin, local NCAA athletes who played for the club, know everybody in the area. Um, I'm sure a lot of the people uh, in the broadcast know him as, know them as well. And uh, Coach Zaleski, I was able to share an office with at Denison, and uh, he's one of the most exciting, positive, uh, insightful coaches I ever coached with. And then I brought uh, my college head coach, who is uh, you know, one of the most prestigious coaches I know, Dwayne Hicks, who currently is the head coach of uh, Division I women's program at the University of Detroit. And uh, for the past three years, he was also coaching as an assistant and uh, associate head coach for the men's team at the University of Detroit. Um, I also has coached at Northland. I've been a high school coach. I've been a club coach. Um, I, I've seen a lot of the angles, and, and that's why uh, I thought this would be a great idea. Sorry about that, Dwayne. Oh, it's all right. Hey, I'm uh, Dwayne Hicks. I'm the currently the head coach at uh, Detroit Mercy Women's Program. Uh, uh, four weeks ago, I was the associate head coach of the men's program at Detroit Mercy. So uh, I did that for three years, and I've coached at pretty much every level uh, from club, you know, uh, Michigan State, Oakland to, uh, you know, to third and fourth grade. So uh, if anybody has any questions as far as recruiting goes, I I've probably seen it, done it, been there. So that's what we're here for. What's up, guys? I'm uh, Kevin Grelly. Uh, I've lived in Middleton, Wisconsin my whole life, been through uh, Middleton youth all the way through high school. I graduated last year. Uh, and then this year I attended Rockhurst University in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, playing D2 lacrosse. Uh, so I've been through the whole recruiting process. Um, and uh, last year I coached the JV Stags team and I'll be returning to coach the same team this year. Hey, what's up guys? My name is uh, Nathan Cap. Um, I'm from Middleton as well. Grew up playing through with the youth Middleton uh, club team with Kevin all the way through high school. Um, I'm currently playing at Jacksonville University, D1 lacrosse. I just finished my freshman year. I'm a face-off specialist. Um, I did coach for Amplify last summer, um, and I plan on coaching for Alpha this summer. I'm also, I've also been talking to Stags. Awesome. Uh, th thanks for that, guys. So we we just wanted to start a little bit. Obviously, uh, when you're in middle school, you kind of start having aspirations. You watch Championship Weekend on ESPN, and you kind of start envisioning yourself there. 
and that's kind of when the the recruitment you know, the self recruitment begins so uh just want to talk a little bit about what we're doing prior to high school uh for me as a fundamental coach i, I learned a lot from Dwayne. the best advice i could probably give for anybody prior to high school looking to get recruited is to work on fundamentals like passing catching scooping shooting dodging the things that can move you up the pyramid uh, in, in this sport, you know, we, we want a combination of stick skills and athleticism, but you can't keep going up the pyramid without stick skills. Like you can have great stick skills and not be athletic, but it's very hard to be an effective lacrosse player without stick skills. So uh, more than anything, pass, catch, shoot, scoop, dodge better than your teammates, watch videos, get on YouTube uh, for recruitment purposes, just to prepare yourself. You really just want to work on fundamentals. Coaches, go ahead. Well, I, I, I'll say to, to this end, uh, Jeremy, you hit on uh, you, you hit on uh, the big fundamentals, but I would also say right now, try to look at other people who are better than you. That's who you're trying to emulate. It, the stick tricks and all of that, eh, you know, that's great to have a stick in your hand. But you got to be able to hit the wall. You got to be able to catch and throw. Also, let me say this, especially prior to high school, work on your weak hand. Don't get into high school without having working on your weak hand. I know so many players who are really good dominating players when they're in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, but they only have one hand. As soon as they get to high school, boom. It's over. Work on both hands when you can. Don't wait for high school. Yeah, echoing what these guys said, you have to crawl before you can walk. And I think Coach Napier knows this at Dennison. We do a lot of stuff. We lay up shooting. Everything is like the most basic thing, two feet from the goal. And I always relate everything back to basketball because it's easy for me. Is You would never just start off shooting 27-foot three-pointers thinking you're going to get really good at basketball. you got to make a million layups before you can shoot five footers, before you can shoot seven footers, before you can shoot 10 footers, and then three pointers and free throws. So we have to start somewhere, especially if it's in your backyard, start on a small scale that you can, figure out your mechanics first. And like coach said, we have to learn and emulate. I grew up in an area like you guys without much lacrosse around me. I watched one John Grant Jr. video and spent the next three years in my side yard trying to be John Grant Jr. That's how eventually you'll build the skills and the confidence to get better. But again, crawl before you can walk. And the other thing, this is an important one. I say this all the time to our kids, coach, about your weak hand thing. If you were a ninth grader trying out for your high school basketball team and you were right-handed, but you couldn't dribble lefty, do you think you'd make the team? There's no chance you'd make the team, right? We have to take that same approach for lacrosse where if I don't have the fundamentals mastered, that's being able to run, catch, and throw with both hands, lefty and righty, then it's probably something that I need to work on before I even think that I'm mastering this sport, if that makes sense. Coach, is there anything else on that? Nope. No, I'm good. The, a few years ago, they changed the rule where you can't talk to a recruit till September 1st of his junior year. So five years ago, we might be telling eighth graders, hey, you need to have a film ready. You need to have your list ready. You know, if you want to go to Hopkins, you want to go to Syracuse, you know, you better, better be ready. But for the good, those rules have changed. So, you know, middle schoolers, don't don't even don't even worry about universities. Just watch championship weekend throwing your Hopkins stuff, have a good time, work on fundamentals, and uh, and, and that'll get you where you need to go. Yeah, so that's a great. Oh, sorry, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, when I, when I uh, started playing for True Lacrosse, True Wisconsin, uh, they were telling us that, you know, if you want to play in college, eighth grade, freshman year, sophomore year, that's when it's going to happen, and you better have film out, you better be talking to coaches, you better be going to these events, and then – as my recruiting process continued and they pushed back those dates, that just simply was not true. Uh, yeah. No. Absolutely. I, 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 okay, so guys, just as a, as a Division One coach, I cannot talk to you until September 1 of your junior year. Junior year, I can't talk to you. So if we're at a tournament and you walk past me, I'm going to say, hey, how you doing? That's it. 
and keep walking. I'm not at your field. I am not, uh, you know, at the hot dog stand hounding you. <laughs> I cannot talk to you. So all you're doing is trying to get better for that time when I can talk to you in your junior year. So just work on your game. Don't worry about getting recruited or having your sophomore film. I, I don't really care. I'm waiting for you to see how good you are in your junior year. That, that's all you need to know. You know ho hopefully we're clear on that, everybody, because that's pretty universal. So September 1, junior year. Uh, as far as high school, we're going to dip a little bit into academics. Um, obviously, we're talking about scholarships and, and stuff like that for grades as far as the academics. Uh, at the Division three level, what I'm used to the most is uh, a lot of your scholarship is based off your grades and test scores, like most of it. Uh, Dwayne and Cap, you guys can kind of speak of like, hey, your athletic talent is also taken into account into your scholarship. So um, Joel, Joel as well was a Division II scholarship player. Sorry about that. So uh, a little bit of different perspectives there. I, I will tell you as a, as a Division three coach, and sorry, Rockhurst as well. So I'm sorry, Kevin, my bad. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm basically only looking at guys who can get good grades and have good test scores. Um, you know, both Edgewood and Denison are, are private schools. They're nationally ranked degrees. You know what I mean? You can do great things there, but you get what you pay for. So uh, you have to have great grades to get in there. You have to have great grades to get ac academic scholarships. So when you guys are thinking about grades, um, there, there is no too high of a GPA. There is no too high of a test score. You can't take the ACT enough times. You can't take the SAT enough times. You can't apply for enough scholarships, stuff like that. So uh, go ahead, coaches. Anything I missed, please. Your grades can only open doors. They won't close any. That's the most important takeaway from this. So take care of your schoolwork first, and um, that will at least give you all the opportunities out in front of you. Nothing can be taken away because you didn't do your schoolwork first. Yeah, I would like to add on top of that. Um, I was in a unique position with Jacksonville. I got, I was one of the last recruits of my class. Because of that, there wasn't much athletic money left. Um, and if I didn't get the GPA, I ended around the 3.8, 3.9 GPA. I wouldn't have gotten the academic or the academic package I had gotten if I didn't work hard in high school and get the GPA I got. So if I didn't get that GPA, I would not be going to Jacksonville right now because I just couldn't afford it because there was no athletic money in there at the time. Um, granted, as I go on, if I prove myself more and more, I can continue to receive more athletic money now that I've been with the team for a while. But again, I couldn't have afforded uh, Jacksonville University if my academics were not where they were. Yeah, and understand, here are the numbers. So for a Division One team, it's 12.6 scholarships okay for division two it's 10.8 i believe scholarships so what what does that mean that means if you're a fully funded division one program you get 12.6 scholarships for the entire team so that means from the number one team to number 70 uh, was it 73 now uh Every team has 12.6 scholarships. And what they do is they take that 12.6 and they cut it up into little pieces. And then you get some and you get some and you get some and you get some and you get some. And, get some. and that's how they divide it up. It's not, hey, you're gonna get a full scholarship and your doesn't work that way. If there are 40 guys on the team, there might be 20 guys who are getting little bits of pieces of a scholarship. Everybody else is paying a lot of money. And there are very few guys who are getting full rides. Most guys yeah. get, get, a, get, hey, you're going to get a quarter, and you're going to get an eighth, and you're going to get this. And, you're, and it's spread out. So where does the rest of the money come from? Academics. That's where you're, it's called stacking. You stack your money, and that's what you want to get. So you start with, and, and to be honest with you, very few guys get 
the, you'll get more money academically than you will athletically at, at most schools. So that's why you got to have awesome grades, you know, and, and to be honest, and, and I'll, I'll, I always say this to all my kids, if you don't have the grades, you're not going to get into the school because that coach isn't going to take the chance on you. You might be an awesome player, awesome player, but you've got a two five. Well, if you're going to Denison, I'm thinking, mm, why am I taking a chance on that kid when that kid over there is an awesome player and he's got a three five? I'm going with the three five. That way I don't have to chase you all over campus and each semester worry, is that kid going to be eligible? I don't think he's going to make it. I can only speak for Detroit Mercy. We go after kids who are academically outstanding. We have one of the highest GPAs in Division I lacrosse. So last semester, we had an average grade point average of 3.4 out of 41 guys. We had seven guys who were a 4.0. Uh, that's because that's where the money is. You want to get money? You got to have the grades. Plus, when we recruit, we recruit the kids with the grades so that we know they can make it in school and we don't have to chase them around campus. And, okay, is he going to make it? I don't know. I don't have, call, call the teacher, call the student, get two tutors every class. We don't do that. We go after the kids who have the grades. So come prepared and be ready. Those are all great points, uh, Cap. You know, great, great perspective on if you didn't have the grades to fall back on after your athletics. You know, you, maybe you wouldn't have ended up at Jacksonville. You know what I mean? Uh, same thing for me. Building a program, I'm not going to recruit 20, 24 kids where it's a liability. Um, I know Coach Zaleski as an assistant. He's definitely worked where he's on call in case something happens with the team or in case somebody does something. And, you know, he doesn't want to drive from Columbus to Granville, Ohio, four times a week because a player's acting up or doesn't have the grades or it, it, it doesn't matter. It, it all comes back to your character, your scholarship, your grades. So uh, hopefully we, we put enough stress on it that 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 pretty much opens the doors, like Zaleski said. Yeah. All right. So uh, next, we're going to talk a little bit about the off season and clubs and showcases and camps and, and travel teams and stuff like that. Pretty good panel considering everybody here played for a club. Coach uh, Coach Hicks owns a club. Coach Leskis ran a club, does his own private lessons. A uh, lot of experience here. So I, I, I just like to say as, as a club, you, you're definitely gonna be able to play against you know, the, the best players from certain teams in certain areas, and you're going to get to emulate certain kids who are great. And obviously going to tournaments on weekends and doing the hotel thing and doing the snack tent and going to the gear tents. And that that's all an exciting experience. Uh, meeting coaches, obviously, um, you know, all the coaches that you want to get recruited by are literally sitting in chairs on the sideline. So there's, there's a lot of positives uh, playing in clubs. Uh, obviously, Coach Hicks and Zaleski, and I'm sure Kevin and Nate have seen negative things about clubs, and you know we don't we don't want to t tune too much in that. But if you're trying to get recruited, uh, a, a showcase is always a good thing because you don't have to be associated with a team, uh, you don't have to bring friends or anybody. You can sign up for a showcase as an individual, and if you know Coach Tierney is on the sideline and you have a great day at the Can Am in Detroit. All of a sudden, you're on an email list and you're getting an email from Coach Tierney. So um, there, there's a lot of different ways to get recruited, it, not just playing all summer long or traveling to Maryland or anything like that. You're like It could be one day that lands uh, you know, a Syracuse email in your box. Uh, go ahead, Coach. Sorry about that. Yeah, good. Joel? Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's... Uh... Right now, with everything going on, it's going to be hard to tell what the best thing for you to do this fall or late this summer might actually be. 
Um, but in general, I think, and for the most part, club lacrosse is a good thing. It puts you out there against other kids, like Jeremy said, uh, especially regionally, I think it's a really good thing. Um, so you can see how good you are, how, how well your skills rank, um, maybe next to other kids who are similar to age than you or similar skill level or playing at the same level as you. Um, but again, I think that if you're trying to get recruited now, I think we need to be cautious of what we're signing up for, making sure we're going to the right events, making sure we're going to put ourselves in front of the right people. And that's further into this conversation. We'll talk about targeting the right schools and making sure you know what you're getting into and what you're looking at. So you have a plan before you go and you just start signing up for random events. I think there's some research that needs to be done uh, probably on your part and both your parents' part to make sure that what you're signing up for is not only legitimate, but it's going to put you in front of the eyes that you want to be seen by and that should be your targeted school list and i think that's a really important thing to tell anybody from a non-hotbed area before they get caught up in so many other things is to create a list and make sure you try to get yourself in front of the people on that list um, and that's the easiest way you can get seen by people you want to get seen by it doesn't guarantee you'll get recruited by any means but at least you know you gave yourself the best opportunity to do so yeah i i would also say the the off season is a great opportunity for you to get the best coaching you can get. That that's that's what makes a huge difference in your off season. You know, there are, there are the kids who go, hey, it's the off season. I want to go play with my friends. I'm going to go play at Club X, but it's not necessarily the best coaching. You know, if you have to travel a little bit to get the coaching, get the coaching, get the coaching. Just having someone tell you different things in a different way can make a big difference in your game. So, uh, you know, I, I always encourage guys to to see different players and to go out and, and explore different options and, and also play with different people. That makes a big difference. You, you've never played with this guy and this guy and this guy. Well, go out and play with them. That that That's the great thing about summer lacrosse is you get a chance to experience different styles. Hey, those guys play fast or those guys over there play physical. Well, now you can kind of add that to your repertoire. Like, okay, so now I see how those guys play and I see how I play. And yeah, that, that that's that's a good thing. So, you know, try and try and also do that. Uh, if you go to a camp, go to a camp where you're going to get good coaching as opposed to going to a camp where we're just going to play all day. Well, playing all day is great, but you're not getting the instruction. I cannot tell you how valuable coaching is when someone can say, hey, you need to move your hand two inches higher on your stick. I go what? Two two inches is the details of the game that separates the good from the great. That's all it is. It's details. When you're doing face-offs and a guy comes up to you who actually knows what he's doing and says, "Hey, you may want to start with your foot here instead of your foot there." You go, "Really? Well, yeah, because he knows what he's doing." That's coaching. And the summer is the time to get the coaching if you're not getting it in your high school. That's a great point, Coach. Uh, as much as I'd like to, you know, credit Middleton for uh, my success and all that, I really couldn't have done any of this and I wouldn't be playing in college if I hadn't gone and played on those travel teams. You know, even if I had to spend an hour in the car driving, it was it was worth it for the coaching that I got and and it took my game to the next level. Uh, and also the point you made about getting to play with other players on different teams is huge because if you play your whole career just with the same guys on the same team and then all of a sudden you get to college, you're going to be in a completely different role in a different position. And had you been playing, you know, for tournament teams or showcases, you're going to be used to being put in that new situation on a new team and be able to find your place a lot quicker, a lot easier than if you played on one team your whole life. Yeah, it's, that's definitely something I can second, um, especially being in a face-off specialist position. Um, I love playing for Middleton, but we never had a face-off specific coach. I never had someone take the time to teach me my position 
until I went to a showcase that had something or a camp that had something, or when I went to play for Team Amplify when they were still around, those were the first times that I actually had someone step back, look at my gameplay, tweak it, and show me the right way. Um, everyone can have natural skill, but that's just the start. Again, that's where the coaching in summer comes over. The details can be broken down, just like Coach Hicks said, and that is where you get better. That's where you become a professional in your position. Guys, can I, this is Dan. I know I'm not on the screen. Can I jump in real quickly here? Um, I just want to let the attendees know that if you have a question that you want to actually ask on your mic, there's a place where you can click, uh, ask a question. There's a question mark. Click that. Once um, I see you on there, I will make your mic live and I'll let you know that you can ask the question. I actually do have a question for you guys that was asked by text already. And the question is, are we going to talk about how the missed season will impact recruiting for D2 and D3? You want to take that, guys? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll I'll talk on that first. I think that uh, most importantly, what you're seeing right now is, is a lot of people are moving pretty slow because they're waiting to see where all these chips are going to fall, how many schools are going to let kids stick around for a fifth year. And I think that's what most college coaches are battling, uh, especially at the D1 level right now, trying to figure out where their guys are going to be, including their freshmen, sophomores and juniors four or five years from now, making sure they all they have all of that um, lined up. I think in terms of recruiting, in terms of uh, the COVID situation affecting it without the summer tournaments and the summer circuit, without the spring season, obviously we didn't get a chance to see anybody play high school. We might not have the chance to see you play early this summer. Um, it's going to put a lot of pressure on kids to get seen probably later in the process. Um, so we're expecting, I mean, at the division three level, we're going to wait. We're going to be as patient as we possibly can, because like Dwayne said, I want to see you play as late as I possibly can, because I want to see the most developed, fully finished product before you show up on our campus. I don't want to, I really don't care what you did in your freshman year or your sophomore, your highlight tape. I'll watch it, but I really want to see what you look like at a 17 year old junior. Um, so I think that the way that this has affected recruiting is probably just going to slow things down and put a lot of pressure on some people to feel like they have to commit or coaches are are putting pressure on you to commit. Um, the truth is there's plenty of time still, plenty of time. Right. And I'll also say from a division one prospect or, or point of view, this is how it's working. I'm sure if you guys have seen anything online or inside lacrosse, you'll see that a lot of seniors have been given a fifth year. So if you think about it logically, what's happened is you take those fifth year guys, they come back for another year. Okay, so now you've got the freshmen who are coming in, you've got the fifth year guys who are staying there. Um, and so what happens is now your team has just increased in size but your players are still the same. Plus, you've got the guys from the Ivy League who were not granted a fifth year at their schools. So, so they're looking to transfer. So now you've got these super guys who are out there and the Division I guys are going, do I take a fifth year, uh, do I take a fifth year guy from Harvard or Yale? Or do I take a freshman? Well, I think that's one that's a pretty easy one um and so the slots at the division one level are 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 not going to be as many as they as they have in the past so those guys are all going to drop down and filter into the division two division three club it it's it's going to be crazy next year division one level is going to be it's going to be an exciting year because there's going to be parity like you, if you take the three guys from Yale and you put them on Marist and you take the two guys from Harvard and you move them to Furman, where, where, where do these teams come? You, know, you put the other guys in Jacksonville and everybody's moving around. It's going to be crazy. But for the two and three division, those guys are all going to come down. So uh, there'll be opportunity. And for you guys who are being recruited, 
get ready. Uh, July, August, and fall ball is going to be your time to be seen. So when you get a chance to get out there, do your thing. Guys, can I jump in? I, I want to see if I can make this live for uh, for one of the attendees to ask a question. Um, this is uh, Jerry um, Bam Bam. Jerry, do you want to ask your question to the panel? Hey, oh, coaches. Good afternoon. Uh, I was just wondering if you can answer this. I don't want to upset anybody. Uh, uh, the products like the NCSA, where you pay and they help you get recruited. I'm sure a lot of people ask this question: Is it worth any money? Is it is it worth a thousand bucks? And do you guys actually look at those emails? What do you guys think about those programs, those products? Uh, I, we we definitely look at them. You know, I, even sitting in Joel's office, we'll look at anybody's film. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter where it comes from. We'll check it out. So. Uh, I definitely don't want to say like what dollar amount is worth what service, but I can tell you I open every email, I look at every every film, I I give it a like, you know, uh, we're humans too, and you know we want to sit there and watch film and have fun with it. So um, yes, my staff has uh, presences on basically all the recruiting services, and I'm guessing that it's not much different from Joel or Dwayne. But go ahead, guys. Yeah, in general, like Jeremy said, I think the, the one thing that's pretty common across most landscapes is if you email a coach, you might not get a reply every single time, but your name is going into a system or where your club tournaments are going to be played this summer, who you play for. It's going into an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and in, in Denison's case, I can only speak for us, I guess, is if you email us and you end up on our radar and we when we pick tournaments that we're going to go recruit at, we base that based on how many kids are going to be at those events. So if we get 300 kids that email us that say that they're going to be at the fall lax bash and there's only 12 kids who said they're going to be at this other event, we're going to go to the fall lax bash because it gives us the best opportunity to see the most kids who are interested in Denison. So again, I think Jeremy hit the nail on the head. Nobody should tell you what anything like that should cost uh, in general, but at the end of the day, if you think it's worth it, I mean, it, it can help put your name out there. Right. And, and in my case, we do open up you know again we watch every video just like every we're all looking for the level and if your son is not at, at a particular level you know that's up to you to decide what it's worth the value of it remember it's a service if if you want to go through and look up every single one of the emails that they already have is that worth it to you is that worth your time um, to do you know where every coach is? That's their job to know where every coach is. So again, it's up to you as to what that service is actually worth and how much time you want to put into looking up all the coaches and sending out that email. Outstanding. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your time. You got it. Jeremy, you're on mute. That was actually our, our next thing on the list. So we appreciate you guiding us in the in the right direction. So yeah, um, de definitely worth it. You know, up to you on the dollar amount. Uh, video highlights. Uh, that was the next thing we were going to talk about. Send it to us. It's self recruiting, as I've heard my coach say it a lot. Uh, you never know. Um, I'm I'm thinking maybe everybody saw the highlight video a few months ago of the guy on the bench press who like does like 10 bench press reps, and then jumps up and like catches a stick. And then like those things circulate. It's crazy uh, how often coaches circulate these videos and everybody watches them. So you can't say enough, make a highlight video, get on get on Windows Movie Maker and take an hour and learn the program and and uh, you know gain a skill and, and send that out there. So can't say that enough, get, get yourself a highlight video. Uh, Kevin and Cap, do you guys have experience with the highlight videos, perhaps? Uh, yeah, so I uh, I just made my own highlight videos. I never uh, paid for any of the services or anything, um, but that's really just a matter of time. If you want to pay, they can. They'll make a nice video and they'll get all the clips from your games and and sort through them and stuff. Which is, it's convenient if uh, you want to save time. But uh, if you have a parent at the tournament or anything, that's what I did. My mom or dad would always be filming and then 
we just go through and uh, find the highlights and make a video. Yeah, I, I did the same thing as Kevin. Um, never paid for any service or anything. I always had parents recording for me. Then we took that raw film and we would make a highlight tape. Um, the big thing for me, um, especially for the face off position, I'm sure it's for every other position, was I always added what I did when I lost a face off because there's a million and one face off tapes out there where it's amazing because the face off guy never loses a single face off, but that's not realistic. Um, coaches, from what I've been told and what worked for me is the coaches wanted to see what you do when you lose, what you do when you don't get the clamp. And I'm sure that goes for every other position just as well as face offs. If, if, if I can add to this, especially this video. So on average, we probably watch about 15, 20 videos a day per coach. So we, that's, it's 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 a crazy amount of videos we watch. I, some some quick pointers. Number one, I'm probably not watching a whole game. So if you say, "Hey, here's my game," and I'm watching a game of you, or and I don't know where you are, uh, uh, you got about 15 seconds. Okay, I should know. You, you need an intro page. And I always say, go on YouTube, look up highlights, see what other people have done. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay, hey, that was a really cool video. Okay, now make it your own, have a title page so that there is contact information. I cannot tell you how many videos I get, there's no contact information. I'm like, wow, this kid's interesting. But it doesn't have your email, it doesn't have your phone number. It has nothing. Uh, don't wait, you know, make sure you've got a title page that says who you are, what number you are. All of a sudden, there's no highlight. I don't know which kid you are. Now I've got to do the hard work of trying to find you. Don't make us work because then we won't work for you. We'll work against you and just cut it off. So uh, don't, don't start the video and I say this to all the guys out there who are the big defensemen, don't start the video off with the greatest hits. First three videos, sonic booms. So three, three monster penalties. Hey coach, I, I can get a penalty as good as anyone else. Look at this, okay? Great, but I'd rather see you playing lacrosse, okay? Uh, other things, you know, some some guys will ask, well, do I put music in the background or do I leave no music? Doesn't make a difference. We probably have it on mute anyway. So, you know, also, if you're an offensive player, I don't want to see every goal you've ever scored in your junior year. I need to see assists. I need to see goals i need to see your right hand i need to see your left hand i need to see you ride ride attackmen i need to see you ride a defenseman uh midfielders i need to see you play defense i need to see your speed in the open field i just don't want to see you scoring goals from the outside okay that's that's uh you know defenseman Let's see you take the ball up the field. Let's see how good you are at handling the ball, making that long pass across the field. All these things coaches know and are looking for. It's like a checklist. Check, 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 check. Oh, he didn't put that in. The Fogo guy didn't play defense. I don't, because again, and I think Cap can talk to it. If you're a Fogo, at the division one level and you're going 52 percent do that that's successful you're going to lose the other 48 percent you better be able to play defense yeah the, the game is really transitioning to like basketball where every position needs to do every skill so highlights of you scoring goals highlights of you throwing assists highlights of you playing defense making steals causing turnovers scooping up ground balls just be versatile in your clips 
Yeah, yeah, I think what Jeremy's talking about there is for sure right on point. It's like, if I'm a defenseman, I have to be able to carry the ball up the field. Now, there's a 20-second clearing clock. We can't sub everybody off. It's just not an option anymore to run everybody off the field. So if you're a defenseman, it's the same as short six and everybody else. We need you to carry the ball. We need you to be good with the ball in your stick. So all those fundamentals, again, pass, catch, scoop, can't do it enough. I have a, I have a quick one to jump in. Someone had actually emailed me a question. I'm going to go ahead and there's two questions, and I think they're kind of related. So number one, this is kind of the, the, the classic question, multi-sport versus only lacrosse. That's number one. Number two is what about a player who plays multiple positions? Is that a positive or a negative? Um, I, an example would be a player who is close D for their club and plays attack for the high school. So multi and then specialization on position. Coaches? Go, oh, Joel. Uh, Dwayne, you're the most fundamental. Dwayne, you want to start, you want to start there? Okay. Uh, I like guys who play multi-sports. Love those guys. The things you learn in basketball, oh, are going to help you a lot in lacrosse. The thing you learn in football, going to help you a lot. So I, I like multiple sport athletes and, and guys who are versatile. Uh, but you know the the old saying is, you know if if you don't burn out in high school, we're going to burn you out in college on lacrosse. So don't don't worry about, you know, you know those guys who just play one sport in a one dimensional. You know, it, there are some people who say, you know, whatever it takes, I'm just looking for the talent. So you could play one sport, but I look for guys who play who play multiple sports. So I think Jeremy yeah. knows this, but I actually played two sports in college. So I played soccer and lacrosse when I was there. Um, again, it's everything I know about triangles in lacrosse comes from soccer. It's all the same thing when you really take it out and expand it from there. So a lot of the feel for movement, a lot of the feel for space, peeking over your shoulder, Jeremy's favorite thing, right? It's all stuff I learned fundamentals playing soccer when I was three or four years old that translated to make me a better lacrosse player. So yeah, multi-sport, you got to get it in anywhere you can. I mean, skiing, snowboarding, anything you can do to physically test yourself is phenomenal. Anything you can do to test yourself physically uh, can only make you better. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. I, you just you just learn certain things from sports. I, I know that uh, even playing baseball, you know, just focusing on a pitch while everybody's watching you, swimming, just being up on a block while everybody's watching you. You know, pressure's on. Just like you get small little things from each sport. You know, I, I could go down the list and tell you what I got from each one. So um, definitely, definitely play multiple sports. Uh, as far as playing multiple positions, that, that's a little trick here. Oh, Joel, did you have something? Yeah, give me one. This is a good one, right? This is a crucial part of this. You don't have to play organized sports. Nobody's saying you have to play for, like, the high school basketball team. Playing sports is just going out and playing with your friends, right? I didn't play organized basketball in high school, but I played basketball three days a week with my friends. I'm pretty sure I got better just from that. So it's not always about putting on matching jerseys or anything like that. Just getting out and doing stuff uh, with your buddies is pretty much always been the number one way to get better. Definitely, Jeremy, definitely. The, let me also on. add, putting your stick down for a little while is gonna help you tremendously. Just take your stick, like like I said, in, in my club, uh, you know, I always encourage my kids after the summer, hey, put your stick down for a month. Just walk away, you know, and, and do something else. So that when you pick up your stick again, you're going to go, oh, I can't wait to play lacrosse again. Instead of it being a grind, like all the time, I got to play lacrosse. Put your stick down so that when you come back to it, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm back. And then you want to go out and play again. Now it's like, yeah, and you want to learn and you want to get better. And that will take your game to another level that it, that you don't get in the grind when you're grinding all the time. You know, that's what the season's for. You're grinding. But, you know, I encourage put your stick down on occasion and just walk away and come back. Then you work on your left. You work on your right and get better. I, I also hey, made the mistake. Yeah, I also made the mistake on top. Um, after my freshman year, I was a multi-sport athlete, but I quit hockey to focus on lacrosse because I thought, oh, being from Wisconsin, 
I need to be amazing and stand out in lacrosse to be recruited. Um, so I gave up hockey, something that I loved. Um, don't do that. Don't be me. Um, hockey only helped me. And now that I'm in college playing my dream, I miss hockey. And I'm never going to have the opportunity to play high school hockey or organized hockey again because it's lacrosse year round. It's never ending. We don't really get the time to set our sticks down. So enjoy it while you can. And don't give it up thinking you need to spend more time on lacrosse. Yeah, but I think everybody's heard Wayne Gretzky talk about how important being a multi-sport athlete is, being, you know, Wisconsin being a hockey area. I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard that. As far as playing multiple positions in lacrosse, um, I'm sure we might get a mixed bag here. Um, it kind of depends on who you're going to talk to. In my opinion, you should never be really changing sticks. Um, you know, if you're a short stick, yeah, you should be able to play attack in midfield. If you're a long stick, you should be able to play defenseman and, and LSM. Uh, but in my, in my humble opinion, I do not think you should be changing sticks. And you shouldn't really pick a position until seventh grade. That, that's my opinion. Coaches? You want to tear me up? Yeah, yeah I think that's the same. I, I think that part of lacrosse is just, you know, being in tune with your stick in the first place. So moving sticks around, changing sticks during the game, I just don't love that. Like Jeremy said, if you're a short stick, you should be able to play defense, offense, midfield, attack. And if you're a pull, you should be able to run up and down the middle of the field or play close defense. That's how I would look at it, too. Again, if, by, if up until seventh grade, you want to try both, but at some point, eighth grade, uh, you should probably just settle down with one and hit the wall with that and figure it out from there. Uh, as far as my, I go, you know, I'm, I think I'm a little different. So uh, when I played at Notre Dame, it, it was it was one of those really weird coincidences. I was a short stick midfielder playing on the second midfield. We're playing against Yale. Uh, somebody, one of the long sticks broke their sticks came running off the field. The coach turned to the bench and said, hey, we need somebody long stick, go out there. I picked up a long stick, ran on on the field. I never saw a short stick again. Um, I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean I can't play long stick? What do you mean I can't play short stick? It's like, no, no, that was good. You're the fastest guy out there. You keep the long stick. And I became Notre Dame's first LSM. So. Uh, you know, I, I think this is where the coaching comes in. If your coach recognizes that you might be better at a different position, uh, consider it. It doesn't mean you have to move it, but consider, you know, you know, someone go, you know, you're a really good defensive player. You've got good feet. You might consider playing, you know, LSM, especially if you're an athlete. If you are a pure athlete, just all over the field, you know, we call the, we call those guys on our feet, on our team chalk, you know, they're all over the field chalk. That guy is chalk. He is, he is all over the field. You, then you might be an LSM as opposed to, you know, you have a weak shot or you don't dodge very well. You might be in a better position. Ask the coach, say, Hey, would I be better at this as opposed to this? What do you think? So be open to playing different positions and then focus on it. When you get to high school, you got to focus, especially from your sophomore year on. That, that's when you got to knuckle down. Yeah. Guys, can I jump in for one more question? Um, Absolutely. I'm going to actually open this up to Bob Williams and let me get him on the, on the mic here. Bob, hopefully you can ask your question. Go. Oh. Hey, Bob. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. So, uh, coaching a high school program, uh, pretty new. It's our first year, so unfortunately, we didn't get to to play. But so we've got a team of about twenty five players with about five girls on the team. So it's the girls' parents, and, and the girls are actually really talented and, and hold their own uh, with these boys. So, you know, I guess my question to you guys is, you know, for these girls, um, you know, when they're looking to, to play girls lacrosse in college, but their experience is boys lacrosse in high school, 
you know, what when they when they put their films together and things to send, what is it that might, you know, they want to focus on the transition, you know, into that girls game to get the girls coaches attention? Thank you for the question. Uh, Coach Hicks, you'd probably be perfect for this. You're on you're on both sides and at both levels. So would you would you mind taking that first? Uh, let me just say this, that girls lacrosse and boys lacrosse are night and day. They are two completely different games. If you have a girl who's trained in boys lacrosse, trying to get her to play, uh, trained in boys lacrosse, trying to get her to play uh, girls lacrosse is going to be very difficult because the moves are very difficult. Uh, if you extend your arms in girls lacrosse, that's a penalty. If you try to be physical in girls lacrosse, that'll be a charging. So girls lacrosse is much closer to basketball than it is boys lacrosse. So I, I would make sure that the, the girls that you're coaching see girls lacrosse, know girls lacrosse, uh, and get a chance to actually go and play girls lacrosse uh, before they're uh, before they they actually go and play girls lacrosse because I know a couple of girls who have played who absolutely hated girls lacrosse because they didn't have the physicality that they got in boys lacrosse to the point where they quit the game because they couldn't play they they got they got caught in the gray and we call it the gray which is it's not boys lacrosse, it's not girls lacrosse. So uh, I, I would make sure, again, even, even the sticks are different. Give them girls lacrosse sticks and say, this is what you're gonna be playing with. Because girls lacrosse is based in technique. It's how you catch the ball. It, it is a completely different game. Like if you took the best boys players and the best girls players, the girls and you and you played girls lacrosse. The girls are going to beat the boys most of the time because it's a skill game. For example, uh, in in girls lacrosse, you can't shoot through someone. You can't shoot around them. It, that's that's shooting space. So you actually have to stop your shot and stop shooting. Otherwise, it's going to be a penalty. Girls, boys lacrosse would would never that would never happen in boys lacrosse. So I guess in the end, I'm saying, make sure that your girls see girls lacrosse, understand girls lacrosse, know what it is before they decide that that's what they want to do in college, because they may get there and just hate it because it's such a different game. I, I also have a little bit of experience there as a high school coach. I coached at a high school where there wasn't a girls team. So there was a couple girls who, uh, had moved from different towns and had played and just wanted to play lacrosse, but uh, they did not want to play in games. And they, like Dwayne Hicks said, they played women's lacrosse at every opportunity they got. So if there was another team or another high school or another club, like they were going there and practicing girls lacrosse with them as often as possible. And playing with us every day after school was almost like uh, practice for the girls thing. So. It's a delicate situation. Uh, make sure they understand both sides of it and um, see what they think. Is that good, Dan? That's a great point. Uh, I've played for you know over 10 years now and I would go to our girls high school games and just scratch my head going, what is going on? I, I, had no, I don't know girls rules at all. I would, I would have no idea even what to say to that. Yeah. I think that's I think that's good on that. Um, uh, Jeremy, um, keep it moving here. Um, I know we had um, I think we talked about contact with coaches. Um, how do you? I guess one of the po the points we had was how do you how do you decide which school you want to go to? Um, uh, visits, ma matching academic goals. How does that dating process work, so to speak? Uh, well, obviously, there's a lot of choices being 80 Division One, 40 Division Two, 300 Division Three. There's junior college, there's NEIA, there's club teams, and there's multiple club team divisions. So 
Yes, I, I understand why that's a question and why everybody's thinking about that. Um, more or less where it starts is at the division one level because they're giving out scholarships and most players are going to accept a scholarship over anything. So the, the lower divisions kind of wait for the scholarship players to be taken and then the division two scholarship players to be taken. And then after that, it's kind of a race between the best academics of D3 versus NAIA, who isn't the best academic you know, best academically, but they do af offer athletic scholarships. Do kids want to take a junior college year to improve their stock by improving their grades and getting a good film? So it's the, the, the answer is like whatever is best for your situation. And it's, it's more or less a matching game. Um, you know, you, you want to match up on the degree you want and you want to match up on big or small school. You want to match up with location. Uh, is it a school you can afford? Is it a school that you can play at? You know, you guys play, paid a lot of money to, to go to these showcases, play for these clubs. So you, you should go to a school where you're not sitting for three years behind somebody. This isn't football where a million dollar contract is waiting for you, like a professional job is waiting for you. So um, pick a school, match up, play a matching game. That's really how you want to think about it. And uh, that's, that's really the basis where you want to start. Uh, go ahead, coaches. Yeah, I think the this is what you pay a lot of people pay club coaches for, right? And I think this is what a lot of people tie themselves into clubs for is to be the matchmaker or at least be, um, you know, give a sense of guide me in the right direction here. Where does my kid line up academically? Where does he fit athletically? And then what's going to be a good fit for him personally? Um, and I think part of that, again, especially from a non hop at areas, you need someone there, you need someone around you that you trust that's going to point you in the right direction. When you find those people, you generally just try to hold on to them and hope that they're steering you the right way. Um, if you don't have those things, then it's on you to do your research and, and find the schools that are going to be the right fit. And I think a lot of it is first figuring out some form of what the cost is going to be of the places you want to go to and then how competitive lacrosse do you want to play yeah the, the biggest advice i would give is find where you're going to fit in academically first uh, ideally try and figure out what you're going to major in or at least what field what area you want to be in for me i knew i wanted to be in business so that narrowed down a lot of schools for me i was looking for a school with a business uh, a good business program um, and then just go from there Yeah, uh, definitely. When I was looking at colleges, um, even though I ended up at D1, one of the mentalities I always had that I know a lot of kids mistakenly have is I want to do in lacrosse at the best level and care. They don't think about the college. Um, I grew up wanting to play at Duke for the longest time. I was a Duke fanboy. Um, and obviously, I didn't end up there, but we played them this year. And when we were on their campus, we got a tour, we got to look around and comparing it to where I'm at at Jacksonville, I would not have been happy. So it's not always about necessarily this school is incredible. So you're going to be happy here because the lacrosse is incredible. Um, definitely visit different colleges, get a feel for different sizes, um, different climates. I mean, for me, one of the big ones is I wanted to go to a place where it was warmer. So Florida ended up being perfect for me. but take the little things into account. Um, again, it's a matching game. Jacksonville ended up being perfect for me. Um, it was at the level I wanted to play at in a climate I enjoy with a team I enjoy. Um, on those visits, I got to visit or I got to meet a lot of the teammates. You get an idea of who your teammates will be, which I thought was a big part of it. Um, you don't want to play for a team that you don't fit in with. So visits are important just to get an idea of the school, seeing what they have, seeing if it's a good feel for you, and then making sure you fit in, basically. Yeah. I'll also say this as far as uh, the, the overall picture. Number one, you know, pick a school. I, I, have, I have three rules for recruiting. Rule number one, you never go to a school for lacrosse. You go to the school for the academics because at the end of the four years, you got to have a piece of paper that's going to get you a job that's going to lead to a career. That's rule number one. Rule number two, you never go to a school for a coach. Coaches leave, coaches move, you know, don't go to school because dude, I love that coach. He's the guy. 
he may leave. Go to school for you, not for the coach. And rule number three, you, you never go to the school for your girlfriend. It, it won't work out for you, okay? So, you know, those are the three rules for lacrosse. And also, you're trying to find a school that matches what you want to do. You say, well, coach, I'm 16 years old. I have no idea what I want to do in life. Okay, well, match what you're good at. If you say, you know, I, I, I want to be an engineer. Well, how, how, are your, how are your math grades? Oh, math sucks. I hate math. I don't think engineering is going to be a good fit for you. So you got to go to that particular school where your skills work. Next thing you got, and this is the hardest thing for, for my players who play on my club, which is how much do you want to play when you get to college? And you go, well, what do you mean by that? If you go division one, the chances of you starting or getting a lot of playing time in your first two years, not too good. You got 40 guys there who are all probably all state, all Americans waiting in line for that one spot. That, and, and in an average game, we only play like 18 to 20 guys. So when you see that Notre Dame bench, when you see that Duke bench, all those guys are sitting there are probably all state, all American players, you know? So you got to wait your turn. So, you know, you got to think about playing time. Whereas, hey, I want to go somewhere where I can play all four years. Okay, well, you got to move down a little bit and you got to find that balance of where you want to play and how much you want to play and how willing you, how hard, you, you want to work for that spot on that team. Adding on to that uh, is just how much like of a social life you want to have in college. One of the questions I would always ask uh, in recruiting is how much practice or w w what would a week of practice look like in season and out of season? Are you practicing twice a day? Are you practicing five times a week? Are there weekend practices? All that is information that you probably want to know because you don't want to get there and all of a sudden realize you've got two practices every day and you're practicing way more than you want to be. Absolutely. So uh, more or less, uh, we, we all kind of said it in a little bit of different words. It's a matching game. Make a criteria for yourself. What's important for you? Um, talk to a recruit today. Location was number one. Academics was number two. You know, financials was number three. If we don't get those things, chances are we aren't, you know, we're, we just don't match. So think of it as a matching game. Do research, self-recruit, send coaches and teams your highlight videos, your stuff, um, you know, check out the acceptance rates, um, check out the scholarships, do, do research. It's fun. You, you only get to do it once. So um, your recruitment will be from September 1st, your junior year until the fall of your graduation year, and, and, that, and that's it. So have fun and uh, play the matching game. Hey, Jeremy, just, just to add to that and to add what, uh, what, what Joel's just said, the Please. other thing that, that's really important is to have a coach that you trust that knows lacrosse, that you can actually go to him and say, hey, where do you think I fit? Am I a Division One lacrosse player? And you got to take their advice for what it is. If they say, you know, quite honestly, you're you're probably not a Division One player, then you're probably not a Division One player. Now, if you want to prove them wrong, say, oh yeah, well I'm going to go and be a Division One player. Okay, that that's on you. But also, just try and have a coach who who you who can be honest with you and say, I've been in there. I, I've seen what a Division One lacrosse player is like. Dude, he is gonna. Those guys are killers. You'll you, you'll never make it, or it'll be really hard for you. If if you got to have someone you can trust and say, hey, do you think this school would be a good fit for me? Should I go Division Two? Should I go Division Three? You know, should I take an extra year out of my life to go and play a PG year? You know, these are all questions that might come up to a lacrosse player. Yep, absolutely, guys. So uh, 
very important there. Just stay focused on it. It's like I said, it's only happened only happened in three months. All right, uh, contact with coaches. So I, I, I believe that's, um, you know, how you approach coaches, um, you know, di different times, different areas are gonna see them. Uh, the, the first thing would just be a simple introduction. Uh, every coach's email is listed on their website. Uh, you can easily find Coach Zaleski's, mine, Coach Hicks. Our, our emails are on our team's websites. So uh, that's that's a very simple way. That's how we communicate with each other. If I need to talk to a coach from a different school, I'm going to their website and I'm grabbing his email off, it, off the coaching page. So uh, a simple introduction with a highlight film. Uh, play the matching game with them a little bit. Tell them your GPA. Tell them what you want to major in. Send them that film. Um, you know, tell them what tournaments you're going to. Uh, be very polite. Um, I'm, you know, I've, I've heard Coach Zaleski one time in our office say he crossed a kid off a list uh, just for having a little temper tantrum on the sideline. So uh, more or less, we're we're always watching you on the sidelines at tournaments at showcases. Uh, we're we're waiting for your introductions from emails, from highlight films. Um, you know, maybe your high school coach or club coach is sending out your contact information, but uh, more or less, just be polite. Uh, prove to that coach that you can be mature, that you do know how to talk to an adult, that we trust you talking to people about internships, about scholarships, um, et, et cetera, et cetera, hosting recruits, which I'm sure Nathan Cap is is starting to get into. So um, just overall, be professional, show them that they can trust uh, you with their time, with their scholarship money, with their roster spot. I will ahead, also add if, if if you are writing if you are writing to a coach and you've got that uh, you've got that form letter all wrapped up, try and get the names right. So don't have my name and Edgewood. Try and have my name with Detroit Mercy. Uh, you know, just it's little things. It's it's the details, fellas. So anything else? Uh, one thing with emailing coaches is don't get discouraged. My head coach, Kevin Kelly, I had emailed him five, maybe six times without a single response. And then it wasn't until I played on uh, a different travel team and there, the coach of that actually got me in contact with Kevin Kelly. And now I'm here at Rockhurst. Had I just lost interest and stopped emailing him, I probably wouldn't be here. That definitely goes back to like we we will take a lead on a recruit from anyone from anywhere from any state anytime you know it just happened that uh, Kevin's coach knew somebody who knew somebody and mentioned Kevin and all of a sudden he's talking to the Rockers coach so uh, that that's definitely part of it as well word of mouth. Can I right. can I jump in can I real quick guys can I jump in with a question I got by email? Of course, Dan. Um, how important is reputation of the player's high school program? Great question. Um, I, I'd say it definitely plays a part. You know, um, I, I'm sure Coach Hicks at the Division One level loves it when he gets a recruit or an email from a kid from the Hill Academy or, 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 or a place like that. A, a kid who has played winning lacrosse, he knows winning habits. He has been coached by great coaches, you know, um, there, there is a reason why people who get great coaching, who put in the time and effort are, are the best players. So, um, yeah, coaches, you want to build off that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love getting, uh, uh, an email from, like I said, Hill Academy or, you know, Detroit Catholic Central or places where I know the kids have played competitive lacrosse, but, uh, you know, it, it still comes down to how good your video is, you know, um, and and I, I'll just say this real quick and to get back to the video, but then we can go on in your video. Please do not leave your best highlights to the end of the six minutes. Front load your best highlights in the beginning, because that's when uh, the coaches is, are going to say, hey, this is kid. I'll watch the rest of this. But if you leave your best to the end, we may never get to it. So, uh, yeah, but we do like the best schools, the reputation. 
and, and it's not just your high school, but it's also your travel program. You know, it, if, uh, you know, when I see things from certain travel teams, I'll go, wow, okay. Yeah, they, those guys put out really good players. Let's uh, resolute, you know, always good players. So I, I want to look at them. You know, they may not be as good as the guy from Stag, but at least I'm going to watch it. So uh, we, we watch everybody, but reputation does matter. And generally, those are the kids who, uh, who have the good fundamentals that we're looking for. And just on the other side, we're always looking for a diamond in the rough. If there's a guy who is maybe a middle linebacker and is, is tied up with football all year and is a great athlete, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to that kid, even if he's from a bad school. You know, maybe he is a great athlete on a you know, non-traditionally great school that, that we would love to look into. So um, we're definitely not throwing away films or emails from kids who aren't from great teams. But uh, I, I would say the kids who come from Kettle Moraine or Brother Rice or uh, you know, Archbishop Moeller, those, those kids, their resumes are going to probably go up to the top. Just, just a, a, a quick story on that. Just today, today, this afternoon, uh, a, a guy from who, who does stick stringing was at a tournament and he's like, hey, coach, you got to look at this kid. Kids from Oklahoma. He travels all the way to Dallas to play. Kid was amazing. But you never would have seen him in Oklahoma. Uh, there are no tournaments in Oklahoma. So, but diamond in the rough. You never know where they're going to come from. And just to prove how small this community is, I also saw that film today, Dwayne. So oh, uh, the, race yeah. the race is on. The race is on. Send an email right now. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Uh, got through those scholarships. I think Dwayne did a great job of talking about scholarships. Uh, there's a certain number at the Division One and Division Two level. I'm sure you guys can guess the the people who get the scholarships first. It's usually the face-off guys, the goalies. The lockdown defender and believe it or not the the great offensive player is fourth or fifth on that scholarship list so um, just understand that uh, division one teams division two teams are spreading out their scholarships so uh, understand if you're not a scholarship kid you know keep playing the matching game uh, the college experience we just happen to have two guys right smack dab in their college experience so um, Cap and Kevin, not to put you guys on the spot, but you're the most fresh. Could you guys maybe give a little bit of information on a semester, a day, a practice, uh, whatever's fresh on your minds about the college experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, D1 level, obviously very demanding. Um, every day went by very fast and every day was busy. Um, we woke up. We, we'd get breakfast if we had time, we'd go through our classes. As soon as classes were done, we were either in the film room, practicing or in the weight room. Um, that took up the majority of your day up until about six, seven o'clock at night. You'd go home, you'd study, you'd do your classwork. If you plugged into PlayStation 4 or Xbox for a little bit and game for a little bit, you do that. But you'd go to sleep after that you'd wake up you would do it all over again you'd have an off day every here and there but d1 level for the most part it's very routine it's wake up school lacrosse workout study relax if you have the chance and go to sleep wake up do it again that's it's about every single day for us it's repetitive but it's fun if you love it if you love lacrosse it is a fun experience you do it with your team you're not alone in it obviously you build a great relationship with your team. They're brothers. I mean, the relationship you have with your college team is going to be stronger than the relationship you have with any other team ever, um, especially because you're living that grinding lifestyle together. You're in it together. Um, so to the eye, to some people, it doesn't sound fun to have that busy, that hectic of a day every single day and being on that routine of something. But you learn to love it. Um, you get in the groove of things, you're hanging out with the people you love, and you're doing the sport you love. So it's definitely worth it, in my opinion. 
Yeah. Um, so for us, fall, we would uh, typically have three lifts a week, which were really intense. Um, I was a uh, I swam my whole uh, high school career and played lacrosse and lifted and worked out. But getting to college and doing uh, my coaches' lifts, they were intense, very intense. Um, for, uh, for fall, we were a little bit lighter on practices. I think we'd practice four or five times a week. Um, nothing too crazy and then getting into spring that's when things really picked up uh we would usually have two or three morning practices a week and then five to six just regular practices sometimes two hours sometimes coach would say they're going to be two hours or an hour and a half and then it ends up going three hours or more um it's it's a lot more work but like Kat said it's all worth it it's a lot of fun um yeah, uh, another nice thing is uh, college classes as opposed to high school classes, a lot less uh, time. Uh, in a typical day, I'd maybe have three, three and a half hours of class. And then the rest of the time, the rest of my day is just lacrosse and getting my homework done and then whatever free time I have left over. Um, yeah. Jeremy, look, if I can add to that, um... So, so that's kind of a D1 and a, a D2 level. The, the club level, which is something else that really people don't speak on, it, it's not as intense. I mean, I have had people who just said, I, I did not expect lacrosse to be this intense. And they go, I'm going to transfer. And they leave, in, in many cases, they leave Detroit Mercy. And they've gone to play at Michigan State, which is a club. Now, they are they are what I believe they were national champions um, last last year. They were they were the best club team in the country. They practice four days a week. They lift twice a week. They have all Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It is a different level of lacrosse but they're the best club team in the country and they get to socialize a little more i coached them for four years we were always a good club but it's not as intense the, the level of play is not as good you know we scrimmaged them this year and you know you could tell who the best team was but again the level is something that you have to choose and the rewards have to be what you want to choose. So, uh, you know, there are different levels. The same with NAIA or uh, uh, what there's a club uh, level, I forget what it's called. Uh, schools that already have varsity programs, but they play club, they, they're called independents. It's a completely different league. So let, let's say you go to Michigan you don't make the Michigan team, you can play for the Michigan club team. Well, they have a club team. They play in the independent league. And that's for teams like Michigan, Penn State, Syracuse. All those guys have clubs. They're in a league. They just play each other. But they don't practice as much, and it's not as intense. Yep, I, uh, I'm, I'm one of very few people who coach NCAA and played club. It doesn't happen very often, and it really comes back down to the matching game. Um, you know, as a club player, I, I got, as, you know, college experience, I was able to meet people to get me jobs and network and, and stuff like that, but the lacrosse was just a little bit lesser, and I was able to focus on my grades. Uh, would I do it all over again? No, probably not. I would I would play NCAA, but think about it. Like if if you're a 4.0 student and you know you've always wanted to go to Ohio State, or it comes down to uh, you know going to a Division three school and and paying much more money, it, it's kind of pretty obvious what you should do. So uh, play the matching game, play club if if that's something that um, you know something that matches up with you. It it's good to cross. All right. Okay. Um, let me let me do a couple more questions. We're getting close to wrapping up here, guys. I know this is you know we're, oh. we're great information. This is all good stuff. Um, this is very specific. 
probably for the coaches, and I'm sure the guys can add something to. What do you want to see from goalies? Is there anything specific? We talked about, you know, long pole, short pole. I guess we don't want to leave the goalies out, right? Yep. Yep. Um, Coach, I, Coach Napier is a goalie, so he can help you there. Well, you trained me, so thank you. Thank you for that. Feels good coming from you. But really, I just want to see a presence in the cage, to, to be honest. There's there's all shapes and sizes of different goalies. There's ball stoppers, there's clearers, there's communicators. Uh, I'm just looking for some kind of presence in the cage. Can does he have the ability to to change the game? Because um, you know, besides faceoff guy, I really think that's the position where um, you can really make up ground and loss of possessions or or anything like that. So for me. Um, a presence. Uh, I would like to see the, the goalie be able to clear the ball and communicate and organize a defense almost just as much as I would like for him to save the ball. Uh, 50% is a great save percentage at this level. So um, if, if you can be over 50%, you qualify yourself. Uh, you got to be athletic and you got to have a presence and you got to be able to pass the ball. So um, good thing for goalies is you can you can be a lot of different things. Absolutely. Uh, for me, you 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 have to do it all. Obviously, Division One goalie, um, you got to be able to make the saves, but you also got to be able to make a pass. So if you're throwing floating passes, you, you're that won't work. You got to be able to throw them on a rope, and it's got to be perfect. It's got to you you've got to be the quarterback. You have to be the quarterback of the defense. You got to make the calls. You got to be smart in the cage, and I like to see a guy who's who commands, because a lot of times the defense can't hear the coach on the sideline, but he can hear you in the cage. And if you're saying, "Hey, who's got my who's got right, who's got left?" You know, you have to be in charge, and you have to have that presence on the field, as coach was saying, that I'm in charge. We're running this defense. You better cover that guy. Uh, the guys who are who are quiet and and you know there's a place for you, but you know it, it's being a goalie is a very tough position, and you should also know that a goalie it, it, and this is this is since this is recruiting. Remember that a goalie there's only going to probably be one goalie being recruited on every team, not like three defensemen or three attackmen or three mid or four midfielders one goalie goalies are very similar to fogos we're probably only going to recruit one per class so that's why you've got to have if there's a school that you're interested in, in particular you got to get in contact with them early because once the decision's made they're they're going after that guy and they're only going to bring in one guy so keep yep. that in mind we, at this level, we definitely like extensions of the coaching staff and the goal. Uh, if you're a young goalie out there, just worry about stopping the ball and making saves and communication third. Yes. Okay. I've got a I've got a question from a panelist. I'm going to try to put them on the spot here. Let me see if I can get them. Um, let's see here. If I can get them unmuted. Um, hmm. well, I'll tell you what, let's not worry about that. Um, the question is, and I, it'd be interesting to hear the answer. Can Midwest players compete with the best players out East? Yes. Yeah, no doubts. No doubts. Um, it's, it's all about coaching. Like Dwayne said, uh, you know, it, they, there are certain pockets in the country where lacrosse is great. I understand that. Uh, a good example is like Colorado is booming and the West Coast is booming. Why is that? Because a lot of people have success and then they move there and they coach teams. And those kids who come from non-traditional hotbeds end up getting, you know, coached by great players. And all of a sudden, you know, Southern California has great players. Colorado has great players. Detroit, Michigan has great players. Tampa, Florida has great players. It, it, it really comes from coaching. Um, it, it really does not matter where you come from as long as you get the coaching, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. It's all about the coaching. It's all about, and it's about fundamentals and getting, getting to those guys as young as possible so that they've got good fundamentals. If you can do that, it, it just comes down to your athleticism. 
and you know in 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 our part of the country you know we get a lot of hockey players who are really 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 good athletes and you just got to turn them loose with a stick you know and you got to give them the coaching you know and let them blossom so yeah guys from midwest can compete with anybody in the world you just got to get the coaching I completely agree. Uh, my head coach, Kevin Kelly, he actually won a national championship at Syracuse. He grew up in upstate New York. And if you look at our roster, every single player is from the Midwest. And he believes that uh, there's a good reason for that, that we're just as talented. And uh, He's actually said that he won't recruit East Coast kids because he knows that we can play just as well. Yeah, going off of what Kevin said, I mean, Jacksonville, I mean, they typically, we typically do recruit from hotbeds, but I mean, obviously I'm from Wisconsin. I'm not from a hotbed. So, I mean, I've been to showcases on the East Coast. I've done camps and showcases in the hotbeds where coaches show up to. I mean, just because you're from Wisconsin or you're from the Midwest doesn't mean you can't get yourself in front of the coaches who are in a hotbed area. Um just need to make make yourself known contact coaches make the film and then get better at your position get better at the sport if you do those things and you get your name out there it doesn't matter where you came from i got one more guys and then we'll we'll start to wrap up here um and this is a, this is always an interesting question um there's always this debate in the midwest about do we have to go and travel out to the east coast with our travel team to be able to establish our, our players. Is that the way to get in front of coaches? Um, you know, there's one philosophy, which is you've got to go out and play out East. Um, or the other philosophy is you get better here and then you go and do your own showcases in front of the coaches when you're ready. What, any opinions on that? A uh, little, little bit of a multifaceted question. Uh, you know, the, a lot of the coaches at higher levels do tend to only go to hotbed areas. So in that sense, perhaps yes. Uh, Dwayne, as a Division One coach, do, do you have certain areas that you're looking at or is it, is it we, anything? Well, for us, we'll go out east and, and look. But again, right now, we're finding players all over the country. Our number one recruit is from Las Vegas. Coming in this year, he's from Las Vegas. Our number two is from Dallas, Texas. You know, so we don't necessarily go, have to go to the East Coast to find the talent. It's with, with, uh, with YouTube and just word of mouth, you're going to find outstanding players. And it's just a matter of being in the right place at the right time. You know, do we go to the Under Armour? We, do we go to Under Armour? We go to Bryant. We go to Warrior. We go to Inside Lacrosse. You're gonna find. You're gonna find. You're gonna. You're gonna. We're gonna find the kid. We're gonna find you. If you're that good, we will find you. And then it's just a matter of, do you match up with what we want, and do we have what you want? You know, that's. Uh, you know. Ronnie Gunther, you know, Ronnie Gunther, who, who played in Minnesota, was an awesome yeah, athlete. One city, yep. And, and that's, uh, Ronnie Gunther is probably one, a top athlete. Uh, we were recruiting him. He got a better offer from uh, another, he got a op better offer from Drexel. This is just a, an example. He got a better offer from Drexel. So I had been recruiting him for three months. He called me and said, hey, coach, I, I I was really interested in Detroit, but I got an offer at Drexel. When he told me what the offer was, I said, Ronnie, you, you take that offer. You sign tomorrow. As soon as you can, you sign your name and you go to Drexel because that they're going to give you an awesome education and you're going to get, you're going to play lacrosse for four years and then you're going to go have a career. So, you know, we're going to find you. But you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to do the work with the film and making the contact and all that other stuff. Yeah. You know, do, do you uh, do you go to a camp out there? Yes. If there's a school you want to go to, go to at least one camp on the East Coast just to 
just to prove to yourself that you're as good as any East Coast kid. Yeah. Guys, I think we're right at the end of our our kind of allotment of time. Wanted to really thank Jeremy and Dwayne. I know Joel had to leave a little bit early, and thank you, Nathan and Kevin. Um, there will be a survey as we wrap up, but again, thanks, guys, and really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, if there's anything that comes out of this, it, it hopefully will be a bunch of kids learning a little bit more, but parents that know more about things. And we're really just glad to be able to have this forum and can't say enough about everything you guys just contributed. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Glad to, glad to have done. No problem. Yeah, no problem. If, uh, when, whenever you have a moment, um, check out University of Detroit Lacrosse, men's and women's. Check out Denison Lacrosse. Check out Edgewood Lacrosse. Cap and, and Grell, like, you know, live streams are up. So if you guys want to watch Rockers Lacrosse, if you want to watch Jacksonville Lacrosse, those videos are up. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully you have a, a good rest of your evening, and we really appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thanks, Thank you. Bye now. Thank you.